Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Teacher Cast Educational Network. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Welcome back. I hope you guys are having a great time this year. You know, as summer is coming and the weather is getting warmer, there's a lot of great stuff going on in the world of educational technology. And today I have a fantastic opportunity to learn a little bit more about math, math curriculum, and a brand new math curriculum coming out from our friends at Orego Education. I am so excited for you to have a chance to check it out today. I got to tell you, it's pretty awesome. My guest today is the Vice President of Content and Research at Orego Education. I want to bring on today Dr. Sarah Delano Moore. Dr. Moore, how are you today? Welcome to TeacherCast. I'm doing great. Thanks, Jeff. It is so great to have you here and having Orego Education back on TeacherCast. What is new at Orego these days? We're spending a lot of time thinking about how is school settling down into a new normal as mm. we've transitioned from the pandemic. We're always thinking about what new resources would be helpful to teachers. How do we make the resources we have more helpful? And I'm thrilled to say that face-to-face -face conferences are coming back. It's been lovely to be at NCTM and some other events to see people live and in person. It is great to see so many educators getting back together face to face. You know, we're having a lot of conferences coming up. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody on, on the floor at ISTE this year. And, you know, one of the neat things about this time of year is that all of these great companies are coming out with amazing new things to support education face to face in the classroom. And Orgo Education is no different. Talk to us a little bit about something that you guys have going on this year. Well, one of the things we're most excited about is the introduction of Stepping Stones Copyright 2022. We've done a lot of updates to the program over the last couple of years. We're thrilled to say we're all green on ed reports and have a couple of really high quality research studies and research backgrounds to support what we do. And we're looking forward to getting this resource out in schools this fall and really in the hands of teachers and kids. Sarah, that is so great to hear. Why don't you share with us a little bit about how it works? When we think about stepping stones, we think about it as having four main components or focus areas. One of the things we do well at Orgo with stepping stones is a focus on the language of mathematics, because mathematics is a language in and of itself in many ways. And then we know that students are language dependent to talk about what they know about math. So there's a tremendous focus on language. And tying into that is a focus on visual models. So we're trying to always give opportunities for teachers and students to connect what they say, what they understand, what they see, what they draw, what they build, and recognize that conceptual understanding of mathematics really comes from being able to connect all those different representations. Applications of mathematics matter. I can memorize things, but if I can't use them in my life, who cares? The point of mathematics is to be helpful, is to help us be productive, thoughtful, inventive citizens. And so we want to give students opportunities to apply what they're learning to different problem solving contexts, to different investigations, and to see the potential for mathematics in, in a bigger lifelong sense. And then finally, because we know it's important to teachers, we've really worked to provide rich assessment options so that they're tools for both formative and summative assessment in the program. And teachers can pick and choose the kind of data they want. Sometimes that might mean a print assessment. Sometimes it might mean a digital assessment. Sometimes it might be an interview. And I know I don't have time to interview every child all the time, but I can take a selective sample and get a deeper dive into what's going on in their minds. And that really helps make mathematics make sense. This graphic really represents how we think about the concepts of mathematics and, and how students develop that understanding. Everything is grounded in everyday experience. We use mathematics when one of my granddaughter's friends was at the house yesterday. She opened the pantry and insisted, gosh, you all have a lot of bottles of Fresca. I wonder how many there are. She counted. It's a start. It's all grounded in experience. We can't do that forever. So we move to classroom materials, maybe in school, instead of bottles of, of soft drinks, we're using counters or models and other kinds of things. Eventually, we're drawing pictures. And you see up that left-hand side what we often talk about as CRA or CPA, moving from concrete materials to more visual representations and finally to symbols, 
to, to abstract math. The parallel for that on the right is that students need to learn how to connect everyday language to mathematical language. So in life, I don't talk much about subtraction, but I do talk about spending money, watching the bird fly away, having a, a dish break. All of those are instances of something leaving. And ultimately in math class, that's subtraction. And so we're bridging that language in the same way we do the materials from what are the everyday conversations we have to what school language, materials language, more formal mathematical language. And then again, ultimately it all converges in the symbols. So as we think about mathematics, it's all about these different representations and how we connect them. The other thing that's important about how Stepping Stones is organized is that when we're bringing these ideas together, we also want to make sure students have time to digest the content and really learn it. Do you ever cram for an exam in school, Jeff? All the time. And how'd that work for you when you needed the content a few weeks later? I found that I never had it more than a day after I needed it. And you're not alone. I can raise my hand to that answer as well. And I think many of the folks listening to us can. That's an example of what we call masked learning, where we wedge it all in, we focus on it, and then we move on to the next thing. Instead, what Stepping Stones does is we say we want to learn over time and give our brains a chance to let that information settle and reduce the curve of forgetting is a phrase you hear sometimes. So this map shows the contents of stepping stones. And if you just look at the gold, um, you can see in kindergarten in the left-hand column, that's about addition. And we start talking about addition in a formal way midway through the year, and it comes up a couple more times later. In first grade, we step through it a few times, second grade, third grade. Addition slows down in the upper grades because it's now going to move into that pink part that's fractions. Um, what we're doing there is giving kids a chance to learn a little and then practice and let it settle while they move on and think about something else. Maybe it's subtraction, maybe it's number sense, maybe it's an aspect of geometry. And often children are still practicing subtraction. There's deliberate practice built into stepping stones. But by giving that time interval, we allow students to remember more. I like to think about that as teaching math for the long game. This isn't about how do I pass this test and get on to next week. It's about how do I still know these things that I studied in September when it gets to be February, when it gets to be test time in May, and even next year when I need to build on them in future standards and future work. Sarah, this is absolutely fantastic. I'm not only looking at this from an educator point of view, but also from the parent point of view. I mean, I remember learning almost 100% through rote growing up, but things are different these days, especially for our students. Why is it important that students are moving away from rote learning? It's hugely important that we're moving away from rote learning. One of the really pivotal moments for me that made this make sense, when I was a child in about third grade, I ended up being sent to the principal's office for asking why one too many times. <laughs> and it's one of those moments you take with you to adulthood, thinking, I don't want that to happen to other kids, because why is a legitimate and a powerful learning question. And so one of the things that, that we're working to do as mathematics educators broadly, not just what we do at Orego, is to help make mathematics make sense. Mathematics is not squiggles on the page that you memorize. Instead, it's a tool that we use to make sense of the world. And one of the ways that shows up is the way we think about learning basic facts, because that's one of those many of us were handed flashcards. And we've got a different approach to that. If we look here, you can see the instructional flow we use for thinking about strategies. We start with preparing. If I'm going to use a strategy that involves counting on, so 6 add 2 is the same as 7, 8. I counted two more steps on. I've got to know how to count. Hmm. I've got to have those foundation skills. In a core program, that's typically baked in if kids are making 
adequate progress in, in the learning. We, we deliberately sequence that in. It's important to call out, though, because it matters even if someone is using these ideas with a different core or in a different kind of setting. Then, instead of saying, here are your flashcards, let's memorize, we introduce a strategy. And again, with counting on, we might think about what are context. There's some ducks sitting on the pond, and one more flies in and lands, and another more flies in, and another one flies in and lands. And now we have, instead of six, we have seven, we have eight. We're introducing that strategy and that idea of counting. And then we reinforce it. We practice it. That reinforcement is really what's the strategy about. And then we go to, so what's the answer to six add two? It's eight. But by following that sequence, we're developing some strategic thinking. And what you can do at that stage is learn all of your addition facts really with three strategies. And four more will get you multiplication. Hmm. And so instead of I have 200 odd facts to learn from zero plus zero to 10 plus 10 and and this parallel for multiplication, I've got seven strategies to understand. And that gives me a bag of tricks, a toolbox that I can use for any problem I want. I'm going to introduce another strategy. This one's called making 10 and show you how that progression can work for students so that that one strategy doesn't just help with addition facts like nine add five in the early grades, but is going to continue to serve students all the way through. The idea of make 10 is that nine add five is a harder problem than 10 add four. But those two are related because I took one from the five and I moved it over to say that nine add five is the same as 10 add four. And if I want to think about that, that's easy, it's 14. So we learn that strategy, we practice it. I have eight add four, eight needs two more to get to 10, and then I've got two more after that, so eight add four must be 12, and so forth and so on. And then I say, how else can I use that? What if I have a problem like 248 add 37? I'm not gonna make 10, but I can make a 10 because I can use two of those 37 to go from 248 to 250. And 250 add 35, that's 285, that's easy. And the last example I'll share is what about fractions? Five sixths add three sixths? Well, five sixths, one more sixth makes one or six sixths. Instead of making 10 now, I'm making a whole. And I've got two more sixths. So that's the same as one and two sixths or eight sixths, depending on how you want to think about it. That single strategy of bridging 10 is something that can extend across lots of years of mathematics. It gives it power for the long game again. And that's why we need to move away from rote memorization. We want students to have this bag of tricks. We want them to know these different tools and thinking strategies and apply them when it makes sense with the numbers use what they know. Sarah, it certainly seems like this curriculum has every single thing for a student to be successful. But my question to you is about teachers. How are teachers able to monitor student success? That's such an important question, Jeff. And we've really thought about it as giving teachers a menu of options. In the same way I was just talking about a menu of strategies for students to use, teachers have a menu of formative and summative assessments that they can use. So within each module, this is an example from fourth grade, you can see the specific learning targets we're focused on. And then as you look to the right, what are the different assessment options that are available? Formative assessments like observation prompts, journal and portfolio ideas, a more formal pretest or an interview. And then on the summative side, module tests, we call them checkups. So I know kids can solve this kind of problem that we've been focused on, but also performance tasks and interviews again, so that we get an opportunity to learn more about what's going on inside children's heads. So much of assessment is really about mind reading. And the wider array of data we have as teachers, I may not interview everybody, but I can interview a few. 
when I have a student explain why they think this answer is right or wrong in a performance task, I get an insight into their thinking. All of that adds layers of better and better information to those more traditional assessments, whether paper, pencil, or digital that we provide. And teachers need that now more than ever because there has been so much disrupted teaching over the last two years. That's certainly great to know and certainly great to see that there's all of that data. My other question for you, Sarah, is what are teachers actually saying about this program who are using it? When we talk with teachers who are using this, the thing they say is that the kids are having fun with math and they're having fun with math. There's strong support for the teachers to build background knowledge because particularly in the elementary grades, teachers teach everything. And so math may or may not be their favorite of all the different subjects that they teach. And we want to make teaching math an easy thing, a fun thing. And the biggest thing we can do there is make it fun for the kids. Certainly important to make sure everyone's learning. Everyone is excited about learning. And I got to ask the last question here. Where do we go to get in touch with you? And how do we learn more about this great new curriculum? So you can find us on Twitter at Orgo Math, or our website is OrgoEducation.com. And you're looking for information about Stepping Stones. That's our core program, and we'd be very excited to talk to folks more about it. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on the show today. And of course, for you guys out there listening and watching, please take a moment. All of the links that we're talking about today are going to be down there in the description. And of course, you can find out more by visiting the TeacherCast Educational Network. Sarah, one last time, thank you so much for bringing the great stuff here from Orgo Education onto the show. Please come back anytime and share your love of mathematics with us. I'd love to. Thanks for having me, Jeff. And that wraps up this episode of the TeacherCast Educational Network. One more time, we want to say thank you to Dr. Moore. On behalf of everybody here in the TeacherCast Educational Network, my name is Jeff Bradbury, reminding you guys to keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students.